بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد أشرف خلق الله أشرف خلق الله أجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحانك ربنا هديتنا لهذا وأهديت لنا هذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله رب العالمين اليوم إن شاء الله بيشرفني إن يكون معايا اثنين من شباب الأطباء العزاز جدا اللي إن شاء الله لهم مستقبل مبهر بإذن الله وهم ضيوف علينا في المنوفية كلاب من الأسكندرية المدينة الجميلة العريقة والحقيقة اسم التخدير في جامعة الأسكندرية من الأقسام المتميزة جدا جدا علميا في على مستوى مصر بحالها ومنه يعني أساتذة التخدير في جميع أنحاء العالم متخرجين من قسم التخدير جامعة الأسكندرية وهم منورين الدنيا كلها بعلمهم وأخلاقهم الطيبة وأبحاثهم الرائعة وقسم التخدير بجامعة الأسكندرية له مني كل التحية والتقدير برحب النهاردة بالأستاذ الدكتور ياسر محمد رضا طفل كمدريته للجلسة العلمية النهاردة وأنا بشكره على هذا الدعم الغير مسبوق والدعم الله الذي لا ينتهي والحقيقة هو بيبذل كثير من الجهد وال... والوقت معنا ويعمل لنا سبورت رائع ويعني وهو وجهة مشرفة لمصر كلها في علم الألم وفي الريجنال أناتيزيا و... وكل التوكس بتاعته وكل السب سبيشاليتي بتاعته الحقيقة يعني ويل ديفايند أند ويل أيدينتيفايد هو بيشغل مركز رائع في قطر يعني الشقيقة فأهلا وسهلا به وانا بترك له الجلسه اتفضل حضرتك يا دكتور ياسر اتفضل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ثانك يو دكتوره صفاء فور ذيس نايس ويب اند يوجوالي ستارتنج يور ويبينار باي ام جاست ويتنج اول ذا تايم تو هير يور فويس اباوت ذيس نايس ويب افري تايم Uh, and before to start uh, this party today, um, I would like to thank uh, not just Dr. Asafa, only the army behind this great work uh, for, for uh, Manufia and Anesthesia Association and club meeting. And by name also the organizer, Dr. Uh, 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 Safa Hilal. And usually I will be happy to be here in this uh, uh, meeting, whatever I'm attendee, speaker or moderator. Uh, we are facing today a very uh, fascinating night. Uh, as we have two young bears uh, from Alexandria come to sing in the sky of clinical anesthesia in our webinar. Uh, the first bear uh, for today, as usually, ladies first, uh, is Dr. Osam El Amrawi. Uh, Dr. Osam is uh, certified from, uh, by MBBPCH uh, in 2007. Uh, faculty of, of uh, Medicine, Alexander University, and they got the master degree in the same university in 2014, and MD in anesthesia and ICU 2019 uh, from Alexandria. And she's working in the same place with uh, Dr. Adel and the, uh, um, uh, the uh, Research Institute in uh, Alexandria. It, she worked as a lecturer and lecturer, not uh, just a teacher, it is a clinical work also. And she is an instructor in many, many workshops and uh, ultrasound guided blocks in acute and chronic pain, um, like uh, workshop in Alexandria and the other governorate, um, uh, like Armenia, Asyut, and the many, many conference. And now the stage for you, uh, Dr. Osam, you can start to sing. Thank you, Dr. Yeser. And words couldn't mm -hmm. express my gratitude for you and Dr. Um, Safar. Uh, to give me the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I will talk today about uh, uh, an interesting uh, topic. This is my opinion. Uh, the preventive strategy for post mastectomy pain syndrome. So let's start. My objective for today, by the end of this lecture, was to know the different definitions of post mastectomy pain syndrome, the risk factors and causes of the syndrome, the postulated mechanism and preventive approach, and lastly, the treatment. First of all, we have to know that breast cancer is the most commonly occurring malignancy in women, with the incidence about 11.7 of all new cancers in 2020. It represents about 25% of cancers in females worldwide, outnumbering all other malignancies. 
And actually, the all breast procedures like mastectomy, breast conservative surgery, lymph node dissection are frequently resulting in formation of chronic pain, which is defined to be a persistent or recurring pain last more than three months. And it was labeled as a post-mastectomy pain syndrome. And it was found that the incidence of post-mastectomy pain syndrome, about 25 to 60% of women who underwent the breast cancer procedures. So, according to the International Association for the Study of Pain, the post-mastectomy pain syndrome was defined as a chronic pain for more than three months in duration that may involve the anterior thorax, axilla, and or the upper arm, and it's hypothesized to result from damage to the major peripheral nerves during surgery. While the term of persistent post-mastectomy pain, it was used now to encompass the later broader definition, because the post-mastectomy pain syndrome was only defined as a pain or a chronic pain post-cancer surgeries, but the persistent post-mastectomy pain, it was found that this is the chronic pain that occurs after any procedure that done in the breast, like the lumpectomy, mastectomy, lymph node dissection, even reconstruction and chemo and radiotherapy. As we said before, it involves the upper arm, shoulder and chest, and it worsened by movement of the shoulder girdle. And it's a mixed pain. It's not only a neuropathic pain. It may be a dull aching pain or maybe a burning with intermittent stopping character. So uh, we have to know now what are the risk factors that could increase the risk of the pain. The tumor that located in the upper lateral quadrant. Uh, shall I stop uh, during the event? Rosem. Rosem. Can I get a doctor? No, it's okay. Uh, so the risk factors for development of post mastectomy pain syndrome are tumors located in the upper lateral quadrant. Female functions. بس عادل بعد إذنك اقفل المايك بتاعك بعد إذنك. Pain during the perioperative period, the prior history of headache, the younger age, usually around the age of 35 years old, genetic susceptibility, the psychological situation, marital status and employment status, smoking, larger size of the tumor and the post-operative complications like infection or bleeding, and lastly, the pre-operative depression and anxiety and psychological stress. So we have to know now, what are the causes of post-mastectomy pain syndrome? It was found that the post-mastectomy pain syndrome, it's multifactorial. It may occur due to the perioperative nerve injury and most commonly the intercostal brachial nerve that may be commonly injured during the axillary surgery, the cutaneous uh, branches of the intercostal nerves, the thoracodorsal nerve, medial and lateral pectoral nerves. The poor perioperative pain control was found to be a cause also for the development of post mastectomy pain syndrome, the tumor growth itself, and the adjuvant chemoradiotherapy. So, 
It's believed that the post mastectomy pain syndrome is a pain of a mixed character that may be neuropathic, somatic, and musculoskeletal pain. The postulated mechanism for the post mastectomy pain syndrome was postulated that at the, at the level of the peripheral nurse, they found that it may increase the nociceptive sensitivity with ectopic firing and altered signal transmission. And due to this intense and prolonged stimulation, it caused the downward regulatory mechanism to be inhibited. At the level of the spinal cord, there is increase in the inflammatory mediator's release and increase the glial cell activation, increase synaptic activity with a reduced inhibitor zone. And this is leading to what is called the wind up response. And this leading to increase in the magnitude of the uh, C fiber if you evoke the response uh, due to repetitive stimulation of the C fibers. While at the level of the brain, there is increase in the inflammatory cell mediators, the glial cell activation, cortical remodeling with increased the facilitation and decrease the inhibition. And this is called what is, uh, this is called the central sensitization, which negatively leading to increased excitability and increased responsiveness and enlarged receptive field. If we scan the uh, body uh, of the patient, uh, we will found that the brain source uh, in the interior view of the body, we will see that the common sources are the impingement syndrome of the shoulder, the intercostal brachial nerve injury, the Bicralis minor syndrome, and the adhesive capsulitis, and lastly, the neuroma of the intercostal and the intercostal cutaneous branch. While in the posterior view, there may be a myofascial pain, there may be a cervical radiculopathy, and lastly, a bursitis. The symptoms of Persistent post mastectomy pain syndrome, usually it's persistent or intermittent that may occur in the chest in about 58% of the patients and in the armpit in about 84% of the patients, in the arm in 74%, and in the shoulder in 32% of the patients. And as we said before, this is a pain of a mixed character. It may be neuropathic, musculoskeletal. So we will show that the neuropathic pain, it may be occurs in the form of numbness, tingling, severe itching, and burning sensation. And commonly, this occurs due to the injury to the nerves, like the intercostal brachial nerve, anterior and lateral cutaneous branch of intercostal nerve from T3 to T6, medial and lateral vector nerves, long trophic nerve, thoracodorsal nerve. While the musculoskeletal cause of pain, it was found that the medial and lateral vector nerve, long thoracic nerve, and thoracodorsal nerves, all of these nerves are primarily motor nerves and injury to these nerves. So it's leading to affecting the motor functions of the muscles like the pectoralis muscle, serratus anterior, and latissimus dorsi, respectively. And this causes weakness of these muscles, and the pain may be manifesting as spasm, dystonia or maybe as the tightness or compression that may be interpreted as a neuropathic pain. So now, how to reduce the risk for development of a persistent post-mastectomy pain? Actually, there is no definite um, procedures or precautions to be done to reduce this risk, but uh, from all the features that they found that uh, the, there are some factors that are common among them, to be used to reduce the risk for post mastectomy pain syndrome. First, they will act on the psychological etiology and intervention. The cancer patients they have a very high rate of depression and anxiety and a post traumatic disorder. And this will negatively affect these patients by reducing the pain thresholds and causing anatomically changes that accentuate the pain. So the management of these patients usually should be multidisciplinary and in combination of the psychologist, the psychiatrist, the counselor, and social worker. The second is prevention of thoracic wall uh, nerve injury, or we can say how to reduce the procedures to reduce the thoracic wall nerve injury. And usually one of the most commonly recognized causes uh, uh, of postmastectomy pain syndrome is a neuropathic pain from nerve damage in the axilla and or the chest wall during surgery. They found that the 
sentinel lymph node defection significantly lower the incidence of post mastectomy pain syndrome rather than the radical lymph node defection, which causes injury of the intercostal brachial nerve in the most of the time. The third precaution is a reduction of acute perioperative pain, and this is by using a multimodal approach. A multimodal approach by using administration of a local anesthetic, either, either local infiltration or retinal anesthesia, like fixed block, paravitribral block, serratus block, using anesthetic frames, using the systemic non opioid drugs like the non estrogen, epipropins, ketorlac, or gabapentin as an analgesics, and also. The, there is a uh, use of the uh, opioids for the breakthrough pain. The pre-operative rehabilitation program. It was found that the rehabilitation of the patients before surgery to strengthen the shoulder and shoulder girdle and improve the range of motion of the shoulder girdle markedly improved the post-operative mm -hmm. uh, range of motion of the shoulder and reduced the instance of development of uh, post-mastectomy pain syndrome. And this uh, rehabilitation program focusing on improving the biceps power by, in, by biceps curl, stretching of the chest, abduction of the shoulder, uh, and all of these uh, may help to reduce the risk for development of persistent post mastectomy pain. So this is an article was published in 2018 to show that the effect of the opposite exercise on upper extremity recovery following breast cancer surgery. This systemic review, they found that in a one randomized controlled trial, showed that the rehabilitation was beneficial in the shoulder range of motion and the upper extremity functional recovery. And a one cohort study demonstrated that the preoperative exercise reduced the postoperative pain without increasing the risk for developing seroma. And lastly, a prospective cohort study showing a preoperatively active individual, they have a better chance of feeling recovered physically at three weeks after surgery. So the conclusion that the implementing exercise programs and optimizing the preoperative fitness, especially the shoulder range of motion before cancer, before breast cancer surgeries, in conjunction with individualized rehabilitation program, may benefit the post mastectomy epilateral upper extremity recovery. So what is the current approach which is used to prevent? or to treat the post mastectomy pain syndrome. First line is the systemic pharmaco, the perioperative systemic analgesics. The perioperative systemic analgesics will, will say some tricks like the paracetamol and non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that they are used for relief of the acute post-operative pain and can be used as a preemptive analgesia, uh, but they are not adequate for the severe pain. For sure, the gabapentin and the bigabalin and the opioids uh, are used for acute pain. Opioids should be used for severe pain or the breakthrough pain. And it was found that the tricyclic antidepressants, selective noradrenal uh, reuptake inhibitors, and the gabapentin and the bigabalin, they were used at the first line for the management of chronic pain. But the tricyclic antidepressants, due to its high side effects, so the tolerability is lower. And second one is the capsaicin 8% patch, which is used also for the treatment of the chronic pain. And it may cause the skin sensitivity, but it has a marvelous response for the patients using it after three weeks. A randomized control trial was published in 2010 to evaluate the efficacy of perioperative administration of venlafaxine, which is the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, or gabapentin on the acute and chronic post mastectomy pain. This study was done on 150 patients, and they scheduled for either partial or radical mastectomy and axillary dissection. 75 received the venlafaxine, and the other 75 received the gabapentin, starting the day before surgery and last for 10 days after. They found that venlafaxine and gabapentin they have an equipotent effect in reducing the analgesic consumption, although. Gabapentin is more effective in reducing the pain after movement. While venlafaxine significantly reduced the instance of post mastectomy pain syndrome six months in women having breast cancer surgery, 
and gabapentin it has no rule for reducing the instance it's only reduce the burning sensation another article published about the possible preventive role of regabalin in post mastectomy pain syndrome this study underwent on 200 patients scheduled for elective breast cancer surgeries. They were randomly assigned into two groups, the pregabalin group and the other group is a control group. They found that the perioperative oral pregabalin twice daily, starting the morning of the surgery and containing for one week, could reduce the incidence of post mastectomy pain syndrome. Then we have to go to the second line of the treatment, which is the regional nerve block. A lot of the regional nerve blocks could be used for the management of acute and chronic pain in the post mastectomy pain syndrome. I will focus on some tricks in this topic. First, the thoracic part of the triple, and this is the sono anatomy of the part of the triple view using either the a longitudinal view or the transverse view. Here, the, the transverse process in the longitudinal view, and this is the costal transverse ligament, and this is the part of the triple space between the costal transverse ligament and pleura, where the local anesthetic is infiltrated. And this is the transverse view. Here, the pleura is up here, more broad, and this is the costal transverse ligament, and in between, which appears a triangular in shape, is a part of the triple space. It's important to know that the thoracic part of the trouble, it can extend laterally into the intercostal space and immediately into the epidural space. And it definitely reduces the opioid consumption and post-operative pain. But it was found that the insertion of the catheter doesn't add a superior effect on the sanguine injection technique. And lastly, it can't provide an analgesia to the axial. Next to blocker, this is a, Novel block uh, relatively uh, described by Blanco to infiltrate the local anesthetic between pectoralis major and minor muscle and between pectoralis minor and serratus anterior muscle. Now, a further modification was done for PEX2 to infiltrate the local anesthetic deep to the serratus anterior muscle rather than superficial to it, and this to improve the interfacial spread and the spreading the lung thoracic nerve. So, why to spread the lung thoracic nerve? And this Sorry, to allow earlier assessment of the nerve function in the view of the risk of neuronal damage during surgical dissection. Another place I want to focus on it is the serrate spleen block. It was found that its duration may last from two to three days up to 12 weeks series of treatment and may provide a permanent relief up to three months uh, duration. It's important to know that the medial part and medial and upper part of the breast is not usually covered by one of the, by any of the interfacial blocks, except for the pectoral intercostal facial block and transverse thoracic muscle plane block. Both the block the anterior cutaneous branch of the intercostal nerve, so it can be used to cover or to block the medial part of the breast, which is commonly spread by other interfacial blocks. Here, the pectoral intercostal facial blame block, as we see here, the uh, longitudinal high frequency linear probe is placed uh, lateral to the sternum, three to four centimeters. And uh, this is the fourth rib, and this is the fifth rib. And as we see here, the intercostal muscle, external intercostal, internal intercostal, and the innermost intercostal. And uh, above them is uh, the pectoralis major muscle, and deep to the inner, uh, innermost intercostal is the transversus racist muscle. So, if we will infiltrate between the pectoralis major muscle and the external intercostal muscle, it's a pectoral intercostal facial plane block. While if I infiltrate the local anesthetic between the intercostal muscles and transversal thoracic, so it's a, a, and transversal thoracic muscle, so it's a transversal thoracic plane block. This is article was published about the efficacy of PEX blocker type two versus thoracic part of a triple blocker for analgesia in breast cancer surgery. This study was done on 60 patients undergoing unilateral radical mastectomy with axillary dissection and they were divided into two or equal groups. They found that there is no statistical significant difference between both groups as regards the opioid consumption. But the time to first request of analgesia was prolonged in PEX2 block rather than the thoracic part of a triple. So the conclusion 
data. In breast cancer surgery, Vectral or PEX2 block can provide a post-operative analgesia comparable to thoracic paravertebral, but with a lower incidence of complication. This is another article published in Korean Journal of Anesthesiology in um, 2020 about the evaluation of post-operative pain in patients undergoing modified radical mastectomy with PEX block versus serratus intercostal uh, facial plane block. This also was uh, done on 60 patients who were randomized into three equal groups, group for PEX2 block, group for uh, for uh, serratus intercostal facial billing block, and the last is a control group. They found that both blocks, PEG and serratus intercostal, they have a comparable dynamic and static pain relief. Dynamic when the patient is moving, okay? With a better shoulder pain score in the patients receiving serratus intercostal facial plane block. And now we will jump to the third line of the treatment is the liposomal papivacaine. Liposomal papivacaine, it's a newer drug which has a longer duration of action ranging from 72 to 96 hours compared to papivacaine which lasts only for eight to 12 hours. The fourth line of treatment is a combination of retro blocks. As we said before, no one of the interfacial blocks that could block the supraclavicular nerve that supply the upper part of the chest uh, upper part of the breast, and so the use of complementary block like the pixel intercostal facial plane block or transverse thoracic block, they could anesthetize the anterior cutaneous branch of the intercostal nerve, which is applied the immediate aspect of the breast. The fifth line is the local anesthetic. This is just one study was published about the use of amylic cream for reducing the pain in breast cancer surgery. And as I, actually, it's a, since a long time ago, about two, it's published in 2000. The use of amylic cream, remyl, amylic, reduced the acute and the chronic pain after breast surgery for cancer. This study was found, was done on 46 female patients who scheduled for breast surgery, received a five gram of amylic, the, uh, the, uh, the five gram of amylo uh, or placebo on the sternal area five minutes before surgery and 15 gram on the supraclavicular area and axilla at the end of surgery. They found that the analgesic consumption in both groups is equal, but the time to first request of analgesia was prolonged in the amylo group. And three months later, the instance for the and the intensity for development of post mastectomy pain syndrome was reduced in the patients who used the amla cream rather than the control group. So they concluded that application of the amla to patients undergoing breast cancer surgery reduced the post operative analgesic requirements and the instance and the intensity of chronic pain. Management of pain with established post-mastectomy pain syndrome. It's the same lines as we said in the preventive procedures, but we will add some little data. In the systemic pharmacotherapy, they will focus here on the antidepressants drugs, like tricyclic antidepressants, uh, particularly like amitriptyline, but its side effects actually lower its tolerability. The selected serotonin and norepinephrine uptake inhibitor like venlafaxine and doxycycline they found to reduce the average and the maximum pain intensity significantly, with a better compliance with the fewer anticholinergic effects. Third is that the anti-epileptic drugs like pregabalin and gabapentin, and actually it acts on the neurotransmitter level and the voltage-gated calcium channel in the dorsal horn. And so it reduces the excitability of the neuronal cells and producing an anti-epileptic, analgesic, and sedative effect. Topical capsaicin was used, and it offered a potential symptomatic pain reduction for post mastectomy pain syndrome after six weeks of use. Here are the recommendations of different societies, they like the Canadian Pain Society, the Western Australian Therapeutic Advisory Group, the Japan Society of Pain, and the International Association for the Study of Pain. I will focus just on simple things. The first line that they approved that the first line for the treatment is the gabapentin or pregabalin, tricyclic antidepressants, and selective serotonin and non-epinephrine uptake inhibitors. And the second line for the treatment, they begin 
to add some weak opioids uh, and uh, capsaicin and lidocaine pads. And if there is no response, so a strong opioid uh, are prescribed. In the original anesthetic techniques, as we said before, the combination of the blocks and most of the blocks that are used in the acute pain could be used in the chronic pain. But I will focus on another two blocks, that is the stellate ganglion block, which have been used for the patients who have a problem in their shoulder as a manifestation of postmastectomy pain syndrome. And it was found that a series of injections could reduce the analgesic medications as well as improve the range of motion in the shoulder. And the other is the trigger point injection. And this is actually occurs particularly in the case of neuroma formation as pressure on certain points could increase the pain. So injection in these areas could reduce the pain. The surgical intervention could be done like the neuroma exciting, autologous fat grafting, or even fat injection could be used. And this in severe scoring retraction in post mastectomy. Medical therapy, which is so important in these patients. And it's focused on the passive mobilization, manual stretching, myofascial release, active mobilization exercise, and strengthening exercise. Why? And it aims to restore the joint mobility and stop the or prevent the muscle shortening and tightness, improve the range of motion, and restore the arm strength of the patients. Psychological therapy. Actually, um, most of these patients, so they have a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, and a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder. So a cognitive behavioral techniques like the group therapy, coping skills training, and the cognitive behavioral therapy and relaxation skills could benefit them in reducing the level of depression and anxiety, and reflexly, it will reduce the pain threshold of these patients. So now it's the time to take some home messages. First, post-mastectomy pain syndrome, it occurs in about 25 to 60% of women develop chronic pain following breast cancer procedure. The term persistent post-mastectomy pain has been used as a broader definition and it includes persistent pain after any breast procedure, mastectomy, lumpectomy, lymph node dissection, reconstruction, or chemotherapy. Direct injury to intercostal to break a nerve and the poor. Perioperative pain management are considered the most important causes for postmastectomy pain syndrome. Multidisciplinary team management is a key word for prevention of postmastectomy pain syndrome. Adequate multimodal approach for the management of acute Postoperative pain markedly reduce the development of a persistent postmastectomy pain. Uh, this is my, some of my references, not all. Living pain free is you right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Sam, for. Uh... Uh, this uh, great presentation. Really, really, I like to listen uh, every now and then to this presentation uh, from different aspects. And today I, 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 I listen from uh, different aspects and I would enjoy it. But um, um, just for the summary, uh, as uh, Dr. Sam said, the cancer pain is a, a dynamic process. So it's a pain and cancer is dynamic in everything, in every character. So dynamic in the character, maybe in neurobasic, nociceptive, or mixed, or even visceral and uh, different severity in the site and response. So our management strategy or preventive strategy must be dynamic like the pain. And I like this topic because uh, this consider like a, uh, when you speak about hernia in, in general surgery, as Sam said, is the incidence is very high. And after that, she speak about um, uh, the definition and uh, there is a debate, great debate about definition, but the, the, the you about a simple way, three months or after healing process. And she speak about the types of pain, as they said, mostly maybe in neurobasic, but any type of pain, even musculoskeletal can appear. Um, uh, the cause may be the cancer itself, the, the, the management, the surgery, even the uh, uh, physiotherapy or radiotherapy. And she speak about the uh, aggressive multimodal technique. 
And when Usam speak about that stage one, two, or just three, uh, she don't mean just the step to give it rather. She, she means that we can just uh, start it like a multimodal, many, many messages just can decrease the pain. And uh, aggressive multimodal uh, technique is the most effective uh, technique. And she speak after that how to reduce the pain. And the most one of the most important thing is not in our hand. In our hands, that aggressive multimodal technique to decrease the pain, but the surgery is one of the, the things which can help us when we can many invasive surgery and uh, use a new modalities of uh, drugs, which are not doing like an other uh, uh, old uh, chemotherapy. And also, we Sam speak also about the uh, many drugs used like a capsaicin and silic ganglion block, but, uh, and uh, the uh, rehabilitation technique. Rehabilitation technique don't speak only about uh, physiotherapy or psychotherapy. Rehabilitation technique, we have a program just uh, teaching the patient about what's before, what's inside, what's after. And also the reasons not only physical, also psychological, social, and even supportive surgery and even financial support for the patient. Uh, she speak about only if you have a case for persistent uh, uh, post to pain, and all this coming under the great topic what's called persistent post operative pain. And uh, uh, what's called persistent what's post to pain is one of the big category of this pain. So um, for anyone have a question, want to ask a question, you can put in uh, a chat topics. Um, uh, a box, a set box. Uh, but for me, just I have uh, some question for uh, with uh, Sam. What is the role? You don't speak a lot. Uh, any, uh, you don't give me any word about in the role of narcotics in post mastectomy pain. Do you have any role for narcotics like fentanyl, like buprenorphine? Uh, like I said, uh, I said, yeah. doctor, and I, I have the. Um, this is my constant instance and absolute. But I don't believe in the opioid free anesthesia. I believe in we can use the other methods for the treatment to reduce the opioid consumptions and if used. So, and I focused on that we can use the opioids in the breakthrough pain in addition to the other uh, multimodal analgesics, but if for sure we have to use it. Uh, you don't uh, you don't speak about your belief at Greek about the evidence about uh, the uh, other, uh, yeah. Uh, I focus on it on the, in uh, yes. in one of the tables. Yeah. Well, one of the tables I said that we can use the paracetamol non steroidal and we yeah. for sure we have to use the opioids in the breakthrough pain. Yeah. Uh, because I ask this question because many patients in practice, uh, you know, whatever you give the patient, the patient don't get a good relief. Sometimes will come for uh, uh, narcotics for short term or even long term because of question. Second question uh, What is the difference between uh, capsaicin? Uh, 0.25 or 0.75 percent and uh, 0.8 percent. How can you use it, and what is the indication, and what's the precaution for everyone? Yeah. Actually, and I, I read about it. I don't have an in personal experience for the use of capsaicin. We don't have it in Egypt. Uh, we are usually uh, asking for others to give it to uh, to to get to give it uh, us from abroad. Um, uh, but I read about it, about it, it can be used for about 30 to 60 minutes a day, and it can reduce the post, uh, the neuropathic pain, the, but I don't have a personal experience with capsaicin. Uh, you know that uh, the, the difference between two medications, uh, the low concentration, it can give in home, and it's, uh, she can put it for eight hours, from two to eight hours until tolerable or not. Uh, but uh, in eight percent, the mission must be hospitalized. Yes. And the pain will be so severe because, and even the package was uh, Quatinza, it's called Quatinza uh, uh, Market. And they bought this cream, it's local anesthesia, and sometimes the pain is so severe, we're given uh, uh, some narcotics and sometimes make a skin burning because this is a very uh, strong bibles. Um, mm. uh, you speak about silic ganglion block and rules in, um, you, you said that a little study and uh, the effectiveness is not uh, as good. And I, 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 from practice, from not my practice, from also a lot of practice, um, I think it can work in a special type of pain if you're basic pain and working very good, even uh, frequent a, time uh, and sometimes with a request. I, I said that this is a, with a series of injection, it could improve the uh, requirements of the patients, reduce the requirements of analgesics and improve the shoulder girdle of pain. I'm with, and it's delayed. You, you said about the little, uh, little study. I will, 
And uh, little some letters, so. yeah, I said, most of other, of others are clinical practice and not a, a published study about the delayed gangrene blocker used in the post persistent post mastectomy pain. Hmm. Uh, because yeah. the results is mixing, there is many studies showing yeah. that. What I mean, mixing, some studies not showing that a good effect. And the reason behind that, if you have a musculoskeletal or mixing exactly. type of pain, exactly. But if you have a neurobasic pain, and usually the era of ultrasound guided nerve block, because I was yeah. working about 25 years, 30 years before in National Cancer Institute. And the most common block was done for uh, 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 neurobasic cancer. And really, it's very effective. Even in yeah. many patients, uh, you know, yeah. but uh, not in every type of, of every type of pain, as you said, uh, that pain is mixed. Yeah. There is a misinterpretation of the type of pain by some patients. Yeah. So you can do the blocker, and it's not effective actually due to the misinterpretation of the pain by the patient himself to his yeah. doctor. Uh, I, I last a question for me, and I will just go for. Uh, you don't speak uh, at all about erectospinal blame block as a novel technique for uh, breast surgery, of and. Just let me to declare something, you know, you know, the ultrasound guided uh, uh, barovertebral block is just created by Nairoz and his colleague in 2010. Mm -hmm. And it was a great block because you can see that in ultrasound, especially in a skinny people, beautiful people like a skinny, like Dr. Hussain. But for me, it's very difficult to do it. Uh, and for uh, requesting the complication, which happens in the internet, they found that the complication is great. And now, the rule is very is regressed more and more, and you yeah. need an, what's called superficial technique, which is suitable and very effective. And, uh, you know, in many protocols, even our protocols in our hospital, would change from paravertebral to erectrospinal because spiny. they give For the sure. same effect and they can give long lasting effect, you know. And yeah. even a study yeah. done by Tolga and his colleague from Turkey comparing yeah. the two techniques, paravertebral and spiny, they found that the erectrospinal the problem can work a little later, have an hour or more, but bare vertebral working more, faster, like a spinal, the combined by the spinal and individual. But after eight hours, they found that the, the narcotic requirement for bare vertebral is very great. And yeah. the complication which happened with bare vertebral is the same, even more than intercostal block. Yeah. Yeah. took 60 and the stuff like that. But I, 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 I'm just wondering, you don't speak any, any words uh, about no, it. Uh, no. And I, it's just, I didn't mention all of the blocks. I, this is some no, this minimum is very great, No, no, most of the protocol, what I mean, most of the protocol now use it. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. It's very effective. It has an epidural extension and the lateral extension. Even the myofascial uh, mechanics affect the spread of the local yeah. anesthetic. It's one of my yeah. interests. And I, I feel it's a safe, effective block. But I yeah. focused only on some blocks, which has some tricks. Uh, yeah. But for sure, for sure, the new era now is using the interfacial blocks, which has a less complication rate, like the erector spine, even in the thoracic or lumbar level, it's very effective. You know, even my advice in regional acid being, if you wanted to learn one block only for pain management and regional acid, yeah, this is erector spine, you can, can yeah. use a neck yeah, and yeah. thorax. Yeah, it's just the one. So uh, yeah. just for the... Uh, uh, I don't have any question in chat box. Uh, sorry, I no. have some There is question. a question, yes, Dr. Yes, yes. There is a question. Could we do mastectomy under regional anesthesia only? No. It's so hard. Uh, first, uh, there are two aspects, two aspects for the patients. They, uh, there is a, a psychological aspect for the patients, so that this is first of all. And the second is that the axilla is mostly mostly not covered by most of the blocks and the medial part of the breast is not covered by most of the process. So why I expose my patients to that? I can give him a light level of anesthesia, okay, with the original blocks with a good anesthesia. So I give the patients a balanced, a balanced anesthesia with a very good recovery. Why to give the patients to do a procedure under only original anesthesia, but no one block could cover the whole breast. And uh, why to do to to leave my patient awake while doing uh, a surgery affecting her uh, feminine if, yeah, to be a female? It's so hurt. Yeah, it's so hurting. It hurts a lot. So uh, I don't comment totally. It's my opinion. There is no guidelines to to say to do that or not. Please, uh, Doctor. Uh, yes, I have a comment. Just a, a short yeah. comment, please. Please, I have a short comment about the uh, no of Hussein. This no means this is a female anesthesiologist. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. You. No. Um, 
But uh, I just I have a comment in that because there is no no white and no black in medicine. Uh, yes. You can do it. And I did many, but but the question came, as you said, why I do it? Why? Because, this is a problem. Exactly. Why? Exactly. Because exactly. I don't have any option except yeah. this option. I okay. can give okay. my yes. minimal sedation yes. and I give the surgeon some syringe yes. in his But this is a very little uh, uh, indication for that, but it yes. can. Yeah, and you sure. need a very professional if, one. The if, second if, uh, if problem with that uh, technique, sure. you need to inject the mini nerve and the mini nerve and many Multiple blocks blocks can give an toxicity. Uh, yeah. So there yeah. is no white, no black, but you know, yeah. this it can be, but in a very restricted yeah. way to, yeah. to give in selected patient, you know? And we need a professional surgeon and, and a professional anesthesia. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, yes. In five minutes, Imla before incision is enough to be effective? This is another mm. question. No. No. 20 minutes. No. Ah, and but uh, no, you, you said you, you said in your study that it can decrease the pain after many months. And they stuff said like this, yes. they said that, and uh, there is no other further studies to support it. This study, this study. is a single study. All the study, all the yes. study, Dr. All the study is in two thousand, and no further study about the use of endocrine yes. in reducing yes. the acute loss yes. after the pain. So all the study, so all the study. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we can make a clarity case before the study because this is what misunderstanding coming to me and for other people. And did you have any study to compare between Imla and uh, Lidocaine 5%? Uh, I, because I it can be used actually, in- uh, Actually, I searched yeah. and I didn't find it, but maybe there, there is published and I didn't got it, but I searched, I didn't find it, actually. Yeah, uh, I, I'm very sorry because I make a comment for your question, so a question come to me. <laughs> okay. To me, <laughs> uh, you know that uh, the problem with the breast, the breast itself or uh, shoulder, there is many uh, variation in the uh, 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 what's called nerve supply, and this is proved by anatomical study by ultrasound. When ultrasound innovation, they found many nerve we can supply different the anatomy different from to one to one, and even the supply. But in some patients, selected patient with a very critical patient, and you don't need to inject a very uh, high volume. You, it's very easy to can to make an uh, you know what the case I did. I make an what's called an uh, erectospiny for the, that patient, and I make a mild sedation by two milligram of midazolam. And I give the surgeon some uh, local anesthesia to inject it during the procedure. And uh, the surgeon was a very competent and the lesion was very small most of the time. But as Sam said, this is not an opinion. This is an, an evidence. It's not an, uh, a routine technique to use it. So forget it because, you know, it needs once working in regional anesthesia in 20 years or 15 years. And a surgeon very competent, very fast to do it. Yeah. So don't... Uh, With a very small uh, I, I don't size of the tumor. To, yeah. A yeah, cons so okay. conservative surgery, I and mean, not a major yeah. surgery, not a for mastectomy, yes. maybe for a conservative breast surgery. Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, any any more question? Anyone have any more question from the floor? That's okay. I will not make any comment because when I make a comment, the question come to me, so I need to to go to <laughs> some. So. so um, <laughs> Uh, thank you, Sam, for a very interesting you, talk. I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I enjoy it. And, uh, it, uh, you know, this is a very big topic. You make it easy and palatable in a very few minutes. Thank and you. even uh, I think many, many of us enjoyed by your talk. And uh, uh, I enjoyed because I look from other aspects from uh, uh, the perspe perspective of Sam yeah. and his uh, great work to prepare the you, presentation. So thank we you. can jump for the uh, the second speaker uh, or just a second bird to sing thank on the tree. Uh, really, thank you. Uh, you know that uh, you, Dr. Sir. Adel Hussain is uh, one of uh, the most professional people in his field you, and also working in uh, the same institute, which is a research institute who have a great uh, a chance to learn and uh, uh, to teach. So uh, Dr. Adel Hussain is a lecturer of anesthesia and pain management uh, and um, uh, medical research institute in Alexandria University. Uh, I like Alexandria and I know a lot of people from there. And he's a speaker, uh, an instructor in airway management workshop. Uh, and his, uh, uh, this is an area of interest. So we now to listen from the professional. And he attended many workshop in uh, uh, basic and advanced airway in Alexandria and the Cairo, Cairo conferences. And he's a consultant in a CISA with special interest in bariatric. 
Uh, and I think bariatric, one of the most uh, common topic for difficult intubation. Neurosurgery also working in the same place with a surgeon and need a competent uh, one for uh, 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 airway. And obstetric anesthesia, we know from statistics that obstetric is more mm -hmm. uh, difficult to intubate than the other uh, people. And uh, also, uh, Dr. Adil have supervised multiple research in airway management in Alexandria University and they have a very big many, many activity. And now we're just uh, going to uh, Dr. Az Adel uh, to listen uh, about his presentation and give us video laryngoscopy tips and tricks. Stage for you, Dr. Ad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First, I would thank Dr. Yasser and Dr. Asafa, the moderator for this, for this uh, webinar. I'm very grateful to be with you today. Today, I'm going to talk very fast because I have no enough time. And this is a very practical yeah, You point. have enough time, so, Dr. Adel. Dr. Asafa, give yeah. us, uh, take your time. <laughs> it's about 9 p.m., doctor. Anyway, video laryngoscopy tips and tracks. Understanding the airway mechanics is very important to uh, start with in our lecture today because everything in the world now is uh, curved. After multiple CT and MRI of the upper airway, during different positions of the head and neck, we have found that the upper airway is formed of two curves. The primary curve, which is the oral pharyngeal curve, and the secondary curve is the laryngeal curve. In the optimal position, which is the sniffing position for intubation, there is flattening of the primary curve here and slight flattening of the secondary curve and what's known as vestibular axis or vestibular tracheal axis is to somewhat horizontal, which is nearly optimum for intubation, should be horizontal or directed downward. In the neutral position in the up left picture, it is directed upward, making intubation is very difficult. In the downward right uh, photo here, it is horizontal, and the, in, during diet laryngoscopy, we push up and forward the anterior column of the uh, face, which is the tongue and bandable forward and upward, making a straight line of vision from the eye to tell the glottic opening to negotiate the tube during direct laryngoscopy. In video laryngoscopy, the scenario is totally different. Your bit, your, uh, the video laryngoscopy is in, in direct form for intubation, not direct form. So you see by your eyes down, or your uh, video laryngoscope, but your eyes down in front of the glottis and stayed off away from the patient mouth. So by passing the primary curve, which means uh, better visualization, this is stress response, less angulation of the neck and mobility of the neck. And this is most of the advantages or a few of the advantages, sorry, of video laryngoscopy. So video laryngoscopy is an indirect method for intubation, not a direct method. By passing the primary curve, this is why they are very efficient in some cases of difficult airway. To start with, we have to classify the video laryngoscopes, and this is one of the most um, I like classifications because um, it collects most of the video laryngoscopes in the market. It is classified into integrated channel laryngoscope and video stylets and rigid blade laryngoscopes. Video laryngoscope is totally different according to the geometry of the uh, device. They all have the same uh, mechanism or theory for intubation for indirect vision by transmitting the photo from the glottic view up onto the screen indirectly. But they are different in their geometry and their function and their efficacy in the intubation uh, in difficult airway scenario. The integrated channels like Pentax airway or air track, they have channel for the tube inside for better delivery of the tube into the vocal cords, but they have disadvantages I'm going to say uh, later. Video stylets as rigid bone fill or video stylet CMAC, the new one, malleable one. Rigid blades, they have two types, hyperangulated blades as the D-blade and McGrath and glide scope or standard blades as having McIntosh-like blade like CMAC. In the next 
slides, we are going to talk about a few practical points. Most of us working in airway are using video laryngoscope have faced during intubation with video laryngoscopy. They are very common. They are very, in some cases, make uh, intubation very difficult or fail to intubate because of them. Now we are going to talk about some of them and the solution for each scenario or track. Step one, seeing is believing. What you see is what you get. Recently in anesthesia, there is no more blind techniques in any field of anesthesia. In the plug, introduction of ultrasound. In the airway, introduction of video laryngoscopy and video stylets uh, and uh, video stylets and five or uh, flexible intubating video in scope, the new one, our new device from stores, have made everything under vision intubation under complete vision, even in, during fiber optic intubation, there is one step, which is the delivery uh, of the tube into the vocal cords is done uh, blindly, but in video laryngoscopy, every step is done under vision. This is minimizing stress, is a very good teaching tool for others. Uh, everybody in the OR is looking on the monitor, seeing what is happening, can help the anesthesia or primary anesthesia during intubation. Uh, documentation wise, the less stress for intubation, less manipulation of the neck. So they have changed the practice in difficult airway scenario. Tip two practice makes perfect. As we said before, video laryngoscopy is an indirect method for intubation. So during intubation, it is a 2D vision, not 3D, like direct laryngoscopy. They are 2D, like laparoscopic or endoscopic surgery. So loss of depth perception makes sometimes some people manipulation if the tube is very difficult to negotiate through the vocal cords. So practice, practice, practice from normal first, then difficult make this um, track or this is difficult scenario more easy. Since they are indirect method for intubation, so they in some literature or scientific papers, they have a, a higher rate for trauma to the mouth and airway. So the um, approach or technique for intubation with uh, video laryngoscopy should start by mouse screen, mouse screen technique. First locking in the mouse, negotiating the blade through the tongue till you see the uvula. Then you look on the screen, negotiating the blade till the vocal cords. Then again to the mouse while you're introducing your intratracheal tube. Then again to the screen while you're negotiating your tube uh, through the vocal cords. Also, if they are in direct method, they are operator dependent as ultrasound. Me may be practice well with one video learning scope, but more than the other, like one, like uh, more than the other. This is an operator dependent technique, most of the cases. Three, midline neutral or right lateral sniffing position during video learning costume. In some uh, video laryngoscope uh, with Macintosh like blade, uh, right lateral sniffing position is a classical position for the intubation because of more obtuse angulation of the blade. They are called mixed direct indirect method for intubation since you can use as like Macintosh like or in video laryngoscope like. So the sniffing position is the optimal position for insertion of the device. Midline neutral position is preserved for highly angulated blades with your stylet channel blades with high angulation of the blade. They may be introduced in midline neutral position. This is a guide, but you may use hyperangulated or channel blade in the right lateral sniffing position with slight extension of the neck with elevation of the mandible to maximize the view and optimize tube delivery. The tip in this is that you have to uh, see on the screen the tip of the uh, video laryngoscope and the uh, tip of the epiglottis and the vocal cords in the upper part of the screen in the midline or even into the left, slightly onto the left. This is the optimum position for intubation, creating a space below for manipulation of the tube, downward, left and right for manipulation of the tube. You have, in some scenarios, you have a great view, but you can't get the tube into the mouse. 
here in most of the cases in midline insertion technique. On the left side, you have a narrow space for introduction and manipulation of the tube. And the trick here is tilting the uh, device to the left slightly, creating more space on the right side for the introduction and manipulation of the tube through the mouse. T4, seeing the cords is not the problem, but getting the tube is uh, in is. Highly angulated blades and video laryngoscope give us a very, very good view. But in some scenarios, we cannot get the tube in. This is because the angulation between the tip of the blade or the tip of the tube and the tracheal axis, as we said before, the secondary axis is facing downward or vestibular axis is facing downward. So introduction of the tube through vocal cords with this acute angle between that uh, angle, vestibular angle and tracheal angle or uh, between the blade angle and tracheal angle will push the tip of the tube in, uh, into the tracheal rings anteriorly because of higher angulation. In these scenarios, using channel uh, laryngoscope, video laryngoscope may solve the problem in some cases because they deliver the tube or the tip of the tube in the vocal cords directly. Using the stylets with angulation, like the angulation of the blade, is also may solve the problem in some cases. Using malleable stylets or flexible tip stylets also may solve the problem. The most imp important track in this scenario is getting the optimum view for intubation, for, for intubation or optimum Cormac and line classification for intubation, not the best view. You may get here on the right lower view. Cormac one, very good view, but you, uh, when you deliver your tube in, they will push here into, into the trachea rings or anterior commissure. So getting the laryngoscope one to two centimeters back, less force, less rotation of our elevation or forward elevation of the mandible will, get, will make you to get Cormac 2, which is the optimum scenario. Here, the angle between the tube and tracheal uh, uh, axis is more steeper. Here is very acute angle, here is steeper. So getting the optimum view is better than the getting the best view in uh, intubation We're using video laryngoscopy. As we said, just draw your blade one to two centimeters and lessen your force will optimize the condition for intubation. In some cases, you have to rotate the tube 90 degrees to the right, or even 180 degrees to the right, so as to intubate in this acute angle and facilitate introduction or negotiation of the tube through the vocal cords. As we said, using malleable, a malleable stylet will may solve the problem. Also, there is a two-stage delivery of the tube or pop when we are introducing the stylet tube or a tube over the style, we may withdraw the stylet slightly when the vocal cord or the tube tip of the tube of the tube in the vocal cords, withdraw the stylet slightly, then introduce the tube without the stylet, drop it through the trachea, may solve the problem in some scenarios. Making the stylet shape as S or lazy S position, taking the same shape of the primary and secondary curve here, may solve the problem in some scenarios. Not forming the stylet tube, the same shape of the blade of the laryngoscope, but making it in a S shape slightly here. This S or this gradual S will facilitate intubation into tracheal uh, axis. Also using a flexi-tab Barker tube here may lessen or facilitate the introduction of the tube through uh, trachea rings and uh, facilitate intubation in this scenario. Also using dual intubation devices or combination between two video laryngoscope, uh, sorry, between video laryngoscope and fiber optic by seeing through video laryngoscope and vocal cords and negotiating the uh, a tube over the uh, fiber optic to int introduce fiber optics through vocal cords in 
rail ruling the tube over the fiber optic down trachea. Also changing the position, slight flexion of the neck may put the larynx slightly posterior and steeper the angle between the primary and secondary axis. Also lifting the mandible upward, not forward. Lifting the mandible upward may also lessen or steeper the angle between the primary and secondary cuff. This is some cases uh, for your interest only and your attention attraction. The five, also we have to hold the tube closer to the connector further from the patient mouth to gain greater maneuverability of the tube. Catching the tube close to the connector with a slight movement will make or give us a great movement at the tip of the tube at the vocal cords and better negotiation of the tube through vocal cords. In some cases, in some patients, obese patients, a large, blade, large size of the blade of video lining scope and uh, some video lining scope uh, with mounted monitor up on the handle of the blade. Introduction of the blade of the lining scope with an obese patient due to uh, a large chest will, would be difficult. So a ramp position in this situation may facilitate this scenario. Also, opening the mouse with slight neck extension and gradual introduction of the blade may solve the problem. Also, introduction of the blade from the right angle of the mouse with uh, the blade rotated 90 degrees to the right may solve the problem. Also, disconnecting the monitor from the blade in some cases of video learning scope. Introduction of the learning scope, then uh, reconnecting the monitor may solve the problem in some cases. Video laryngoscopy and difficult intubation. Not all video laryngoscopes are efficient in difficult scenarios, especially in, in large tongue, in patients with very highly limited neck mobility, hyperangulated blades and channel blades, and maybe flexible stylets uh, work well with these scenarios. But Macintosh light may not be efficient in these scenarios. Macintosh light may be more efficient in lesser cases of angulation or difficulty, or in cases of large secretions, because they are mixed direct and direct laryngoscope, so we can look by your eyes to see the vocal cords and the the tube through. The choice of the video laryngoscopy usually it is case sensitive and operator dependent in between channeled and non-channeled hyperangulated and macintosh light. As we said before, channel uh, laryngoscope facilitate delivery of the tube to the vocal cords, but manipulation if the tube is more difficult in channel than more non-channel tubes. Manipulation of the tube is more easy in, hyper in other types of plates, so in hyperangulated or macintosh light. Hyperangulated blade uh, laryngoscope work well with cases of difficult scenario, as a blade or McGrath or glide scope. But they are very difficult through uh, delivering the tubes through vocal cords down trachea. Back in touch light is more easier, but they doesn't work well with uh, most of cases of difficult scenarios. So the video lining scope chosen must be selected according to the indication, according to the operator preference, according to the case criteria. Is video laryngoscopy a substitute for fiber optic intubation? Most of cases, no. We have to, uh, in difficult scenarios or difficult airway, usually we have to take or plan A, plan B, plan C. Plan A may include awake intubation, plan B may include other device of video laryngoscope, plan C may include invasive airway. So you have to take multiple devices at difficult airway scenarios. Not single devices is a gold standard or a gold solution for every case of difficult intubation. So to take him, I must took him message. First, new guidelines for difficult airway society 222 are stressing mainly on maintaining oxygenation during all over the procedure for intubation. Maintenance of oxygenation is more important than intubation itself. Not intubation is the only method for maintenance of oxygenation of the patient. 
So we don't have to rush for intubation in cases of difficult scenario. You have to maintain oxygenation and even canceling the case. Limit the trials and call for help. We have to limit our trials because in some scenarios, repeated trials may convert difficult uh, scenarios or cannot ventilate scenarios into cannot ventilate scenarios. So it may make the scenarios more difficult. So you have to limit your trial score for help for senior or a difficult airway uh, senior in the field of anesthesia or OR to manage the case. This is better for you and the case uh, for sure. Await intubation whenever possible to maintain oxygenation. The gold standard, the, the first option, the non-negotiable option for intubation of expected difficult airway scenarios is awake intubation. Maintaining of spontaneous breathing of the patient is the gold standard for, for uh, maintaining oxygenation. So there is no gold standard device in difficult airway, as we said before. Video laryngoscopy are different in geometry and indication. To perform video laryngoscopy, you have to create a space. Video laryngoscopy is a direct, indirect method for intubation. So to see well vocal cords and pharynx and larynx, you have to create space by lifting the tongue upward and the mandible by other device, by the same device, according to, to the method of video laryngoscopy or fiber optic you are using. But you have to create space to see the vocal cords through. Airway management is a case sensitive don't try a new device in a difficult airway scenario. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Adil, uh, for the tricks. And this is a new innovation for technology. Uh, really, when I started my career, it was not nothing like this. Uh, the only thing when I have a difficult intubation, and I, I think Dr. Asafa is not all like me, but can agree with me for that. Uh, the only thing you would do before just we do an um, awake uh, nasal intubation uh, uh, by a rubber tube and it was an uh, you know scenario sometimes difficult uh, but now the technology opens the gate for us to uh, 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 to act, uh, or assess and to uh, manipulate and to treat the difficult way but um, again uh, if you expect the difficult intubation there is no difficult intubation the anticipation is very important and uh, using the, this uh, different type according to your preference and your experience and availability of the resources is very important. Um, again, uh, Dr. Adil said also no one just will die from uh, failure of intubation, but everyone will die from the failure of ventilation and uh, uh, safety is paramount all the time. Um, again, uh, for any question um, for Dr. Adil and expert for uh, difficult way. Um, you can just put it in a uh, uh, chat box. No question. Um, uh, you know, I have an, a small question. You know, Dr. Adil, if you, put, uh, if you succeed to put uh, the tube by video laryngoscopy or even was assisted with fiber optic uh, intubation, uh, really it, it is a good a chance to put the tube but to know the depth of the tube, I, I think you can use an ultrasound or just you can assess the, the depth of the tube in the trachea uh, with, the, with the video uh, uh, laryngoscope. Video laryngoscopy, most of uh, video laryngoscope is not introduced through the trachea. So mm -hmm. the most popular method for uh, knowing the depth of the trachea tube in the trachea is fiber optic or ultrasound. Thank you, Trad. Any other question for? Uh... I, I have a comment, please, Dr. Yeah. Yasser. Uh, exactly, sure. uh, video laryngoscopy was very beneficial for me uh, in thyroid cases. Uh, during the insertion of the tube, I, I see that the, the movement of both vocal cord uh, or yeah. its uh, asymmetry. And during yeah. uh, when I, I, I wake up the patient at the last of the operation, at the end of the operation, I uh, if the same picture or the same style of movement to post vocal cord present, it, it was successful for me. Am yes, I right, sir. Adil? Am I right? Or I, uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't hear uh, your last uh, words for, uh, yes, from the question. Just a comment. Just a comment. It's not a question. Um, please uh, say it again. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. 
the video laryngoscopy was so beneficial for me during uh, use, uh, using it in induction of anesthesia in thyroid mm -hmm. cases especially but yet yes. I can show the symmetry and or asymmetry of post vocal cord movement movement and so when I waking up my patient in the post operative uh, period I see the same if I see the same movement or I see the asymmetry of post vocal cord movement uh, just um, Confidential for me, or I convinced it, no injury of uh, vocal cord happened. The, the movement, the, the same type of movement happened at the end. Yes, of this is, yes, this is right. Uh, video laryngoscopy is less stressful uh, method for intubation or even yes. uh, laryngoscopy. Yes. So yes. recently, they are used uh, in preoperative assessment of vocal cords in a very uh, or in awake patient. In, in okay, a very, can see in the a, movement in, in, a, in a very patient. marvelous way. Marvelous yes. way. Yes. 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 Yeah. yes. It, it could was, be inserted yes. in awake patient under local anesthesia, xylocaine inhalational or spray. Yes. You may see the vocal cords examination before and after anesthesia. And uh, I did it multiple times to check yes. the vocal cord movements so in some cases of post thyroidectomy yes. con uh, con uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, concussion. And so me, and so me. It, uh, yeah, I used it many, many times, in, especially in thyroid cases and neck masks. And this was amazing for me to see the view from approach. Just I, I, in this position, I'm not uh, like so. And it was so amazing for me. And in some cases of expected difficult intubation, uh, in some literature, they use video line, highly angulated uh, video lining scope for a preoperative assessment of the vocal cords and airway yes. Uh, yes. to see yes. or to decide the plan for intubation during general anesthesia. Pre yes, and, and your, please, uh, uh, your comment about the angulation, the acute angulation of trachea and the, the difficulty to induce the trachea was so beneficial sure. for me. I met, I met it very, very time. Before. Most, most of us uh, met this scenario and didn't know what is the problem. And they yes, see the vocal yes. cords perfectly, exactly. but they cannot negotiate the tube end. Exactly, exactly, yes. exactly. Very nice uh, point, very nice point. Yeah. Uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Nagy uh, asked you about uh, the um, uh, low motility of mouse or uh, the narrow mouse. Is video laryngoscopy is uh, optimal for such cases? Okay, so in, 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 in a narrow mouse or narrow mouse opening, video laryngoscopy may be very beneficial in some scenarios, and this is according to the geometry of the blade of the laryngoscope. In some cases, our video deep blade geometry is a, a diameter of the blade is 1.8 millimeter. So a mouse opening of two centimeters is efficient for introduction of the deep blade. And you don't have to push it forward because the hyperangulation of the blade fit well in the primary curve for airway. So putting your eyes in front of vocal cords. But yes. in some scenarios, other types of video laryngoscopes, they may are they, their blade is broader, shorter. So introduction in a limited mouse opening is very difficult. So the standard in these cases is fiber optic intubation or video styles. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm seeing uh, multiple you questions. You know that you here. speak about Barker tube, Dr. Adel. Sorry, I have a yes. question here from uh, Dr. Karim Mukhtar. Uh, okay. It is related to the same question. You know, you speak about armal tube uh, and diff in, uh, difficult uh, uh, video laryngoscopy, even difficult fiber optics, and they meet Barker himself to show me why he created this tube. And okay. uh, Dr. Karim Mukhtar he said is armal. I, I, I need to know that to show for the candidate what the difference between regular tube and uh, 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 Barker tube. And the, another question came in the same scenario. Uh, from uh, Karim, Dr. Karim, is armal tube more easy or difficult than conventional tube in the setting of video laryngoscopy? Okay, I, I didn't use Barker tube, uh, uh, honest to be honest with you, but the difference here is that the tip of the Barker tube is a slightly flexed uh, inward, not uh, a straight tip. So during introduction into the trachea, they doesn't uh, get into the trachea rings and stop they slide forward or downwards the trachea. But you bet the in, inventor of the tube, so we can uh, uh, You know that this tube knowledge. he created, yeah. 
He created because uh, from the time of the tube, you know, first tube, it was metal, it was beveled, and no one knew why, what's the evidence behind. And he made a study in ICU, he found this tube is very traumatic, it's our tube. And he created this tube as a tape is siliconized, silicon, like a jelly, you know, like oh, implant oh. in the breast. Very, very uh, siliconized, very like malleable, so and you can bend and you can slip sliding very easy without no trauma. Even in fiber optic, sometimes you go for the posterior commission and you see the fiber optic in trachea and you try to put the trachea and you can't put, you put the tube inside the trachea, can. But with fiber optic, in many studies, it was uh, fiber optic and barker tube in difficult cases, uh, very easy. And we use it for many, many times and very, very effective too. But the problem is uh, a little uh, expensive. Uh, but uh, you know that he speak about uh, Dr. Karim about the uh, uh, armal tube. Uh, you know, he said it's more easy to put it in difficult uh, tube or uh, the conventional tube, which is more difficult. I, I think it is an operator dependent case sensitive scenarios. May in some cases introduction uh, for sure flexible tube will be introduced more easily. I didn't have uh, a look in the, the literature, the difference between armored or fiber optic during introduction to the tube. Mm -hmm. My practice, I didn't see a, a, a big difference in between, but I didn't use uh, armored uh, over fiber optic uh, too much. Um, I, I don't um, have a, a clear answer for this question, sorry, but I, it depends yes. upon the operator more, uh, most commonly. Yes. Yes. The, thank you for the great answer. You know, <laughs> if you don't have answer, this answer. Uh, yes. what, what is the difference? Uh, other uh, colleague asking, what is the difference between the C Mac and the Glide Scope? I okay. think in my manufacturing, I don't understand the manufacturing, but you know, and uh, uh, is one is more better than others. Okay, C Mac is a C Mac is a system. It is not a single device. C Mac is a system, including video laryngoscopy. Uh, with two types, CMAC traditional, Macintosh Miller like, and CMAC hyper angulated, the D blade, and the um, CMAC video stylet, and the CMAC 5 uh, flexible intubating video endoscopy. So it has a multiple uh, types, but I think you are asking about the video rigid laryngoscope type, the difference between the CMAC and the glidescope. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the CMAC two types, Macintosh and Miller like this is a one limp and D blade limp and the Glidescope. The Macintosh and Miller limp, it's not like uh, Glidescope. A Glidescope is a hyper angle. It is a classical Glidescope. They are manufacturing now reusable uh, Glidescopes with a steeper angle and steeper blade. But the classical glidoscope hyperangulated with 60 degree blade, it is a hyperangulated blade. So it may be differentiated with the D blade, not the CMAC or classical Macintosh like CMAC or uh, Miller like. CMAC and Miller, Miller like, it is a video learning scope. It is just a technology putting the picture on a monitor. It is like Miller like scope classically with the same blade like. But it is an indirect method for intubation. Besides, it is a direct method, so uh, it is a combined one. Like the Macintosh also. Macintosh is a hyperangulated, uh, sorry, it's more angulated than the classical Macintosh blade or learning scope. It's more angulated slightly, reaching up to 30 degree. So it may be beneficial in some cases of difficult airway, not all cases. Hyperangulated deep blade is the manufactured for the difficult intubation or manufactured, this plate is manufactured. No? So the blade yeah. may be compared with the glidoscope. A, gl a glidoscope uh, with, with the blade, the blade is a 40 degree, glidoscope is a 60 degree. So a glidoscope is a, a more acute angle with a shorter blade. So it, we may see a glide scope with blade five. CMAC is a, is a blade four only with a steeper angle, 40 degree, have more like blade. Uh, I, uh, for myself, I'm preferring the blade than glide scope. I didn't practice too much intubation with a glide scope, but I think a glide scope, uh, in, in some cases, the tank, uh, in between the blades, 
because of the acute angle. So may, uh, manipulation is difficult in the mouse than the deep blade. So my preference, as we said before, video laryngoscopy is an operator preference. My preference is with the deep blade. Yeah. Okay. Another question and uh, from uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Mohammed Ahmed. Uh, he said is, it may be away from our presentation, but um, he asked about your approach for airway anesthesia for a weak intubation, how to approach for a weak intubation uh, for difficult airway. It's like okay. a practical I'll... issue. Okay, I think, um, I, 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 let me talk in Arabic, please, for this case. Uh, uh, difficult, difficult intubation scenarios the call anesthesia uh, is an optimum method for intubation. We may uh, use a spray as you go technique. You may use, use airway blocks with inhalational uh, xylocaine. You may use Brisidex is an optimum method for intubation. I tried most of these cases. I tried most of this, this case, minimal sedation with darmicum and fentanyl. Okay, I tried most of these cases, but airway blocks, with uh, minimal um, Brisidex infusion, I think it is a very optimum scenario for uh, awake intubation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we don't no, have more questions. Yeah. 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 Dr. Adel, this is uh, Dr. Wissam Sultan, is uh, assistant professor of anesthesia and one of our experts in uh, airway. And he used the, the yeah. fiber optic many, many times. Yeah. And he is the pioneer of uh, fiber uh, optic uh, in uh, our department in Manufia University. That's yeah, Sharaf Layers. He's a uh, Sultan Wissam. He's a Sultan Wissam, not Wissam yes, Sultan. He's a because Sultan he's a, his rank. <laughs> He's ranked I know that he's your best Mr. friend, Dr. Yasser. <laughs> Thank you very much. This, uh, yes. uh, I have just a question. Um, sometimes you are facing patients in the OR and the patient said uh, before in another operation, the doctors told me that you are, uh, you had a very difficult yeah, yeah. Yes. So in, in such patients, um, do you think is it better? And and sometimes you know the 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 possibility causes of uh, difficulty that it was done by junior staff or uh, there is uh, improper muscle relaxation or uh, sometimes the reposition is not uh, properly uh, uh, good for for uh, for intubation. Uh, did do you be referred to such patients if you didn't find any? Uh, 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 causes or obvious causes for difficulty that you, you have to assess the patient again by by the uh, conventional laryngoscopy and to see the uh, the cork and link classification uh, to not just to not put a stamp for such patient that he's difficult in vision for all procedures and he's not. Do you think is it better to, to start first with the laryngoscopy for just conventional laryngoscopy before you start adding any uh, other difficult uh, airway tool? Lena Neba Mutafakin Awalan, preoperative assessment of the patient airway is very crucial. Okay. I may assess it in a way, you may assess it, uh, you, you may assess it in a different way. I may approach in a way, you may approach it in a different way. So assessment, preoperative assessment, preoperative assessment, I have to assess my patient first. This is first of all. The second scenario, okay, I'm going to ask about his history, hospital anesthetist, if he, he remembers that, uh, try to induce him. But I have to be prepared in any scenario. I'm sorry, this is uh, the, the, the life of my patients, not my opinion, not my practice, not, not, not my ego. So a, a history of difficult intubation means a lot for the patient. So I have to be prepared. I have to be prepared. I have to have my video laryngoscopy beside me, fiber optic beside me, if I'm going preoperative assessment indicated for awake intubation. I have to be prepared for this patient. Um, this is a mes message I want to deliver from your question, okay? But what device I'm going to start with, uh, I'm going to start according to my pre-operative uh, pre assessment, but I have to be prepared. 
Um, okay, uh, I agree with you totally. Agree with you. But sometimes, you know, there is no no obvious uh, causes for difficult observation. No, I'm not, I'm not like that. Yeah. Okay, I, I, it's not uh, it's not a big deal to use video laryngoscopy in a normal patient, but it is a catastrophic not to be prepared for this patient and using my direct laryngoscope, and he's already difficult for uh, uh, some hidden reason I didn't see. Yes, yeah. but you know my yeah, my question is about to not to not uh, both yeah, to put the patient in the right way or to put the patient in the uh, uh, in his right classification. Uh, uh, not be, not because some, somebody before he said that this patient's difficult to intubation, to what is come for the patient that is difficult in intubation, he's not. Okay, I'm, why, I'm, because, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm with you totally. I'm, I'm with you, to, I'm going to approach my approach according to my pre-operative assessment. Yeah. But I, 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 the, the problem is that I, um, I disagree with you. I, I, um, I, don't, I don't neglect the history. This has no, no, is, should, be, is, is, should be respected. Yes, yes I know. Okay, I okay, um, um, yes, agree with you. But yes. you know, if we are using the, uh, the new tools for uh, airway, so um, I, I, I will miss uh, in something. If this patient is difficult or not. Okay. That's, that's, uh, that's the back of my question. Yes. Uh, 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 okay, okay, I'm with you totally. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, I, I think you know more question here. Uh, but I need uh, your your question. Not my question, but I just will uh, just make an, a small hint about your presentation. And uh, uh, thank you for Dr. Sam and uh, uh, Dr. Adel Hussein. Uh, but uh, I'm just very happy about this debate in our presentation because uh, discussion without debate is not interested at all. We need a debate all the time. Uh, and at the end, um, my advice, uh, because I'm interested in airway also, my advice for everyone, don't to go to put an, uh, if you have the tools, to put a tube in difficult uh, uh, situation, difficult airway, without simulation training, without attending basic and advancing airway courses with simulation, without putting an, in, in a live patient, but under supervision for the, from the professional until he give you the car to be a professional to do that. And uh, do whatever you are expert in. For Dr. Adel, as I said, for me, I like Glidescope because I use it all the time. I'm professional in it. And I found the best, but Dr. Adel found some things best. Uh, but at the end, just use whatever you, uh, you do and whatever the resources permit to save your patient and safety is first. Uh, and thank you very, very much for the... Uh, and the Dr. Yasser. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Yasser, I just wanted to add another point to your, uh, yes. sure. uh, for your points is that uh, 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 start to uh, exercise with, the, uh, with these tools in a normal patient before using it in the difficult patients. Yeah, this is sure, Dr. Susan. Uh, usually we do that when I get a fiber optic, I just was make an ambition sleepy. And uh, I think Dr. Talat, uh, Allah to give him the health and the power and to bless him and they come to teach us uh, in a normal vision of sleeping and uh, you know you must go step by step uh, and the word now for Dr. Safa and thank you for uh, your night and for your time uh, Dr. Safa هو ناجي كان فاضل له سؤال دكتور ياسر بعد اذن حضرتك يعني ناجي كان بيسال سؤال فبعد اذن حضرتك هو السؤال موجود دقيقه واحده بس حضرتك وبعدين انا هختم ناجي ناجي كان له سؤال معلش ما شفتوش في الشات بوكس اه ذس يو نو ديفرنت تايب اوف فيديو لانجوسكوبي اند ادابت تيوب انسايد uh, Doctor, uh, speak. Uh, he, he asking this question about the mouse opening limited. Doctor Nagy, uh, our professor here, and um, uh, I think he's answered the question. And uh, if not, I think uh, Doctor Nagy can answer his question. Again. Okay. Okay. Uh, this one. Every intubation thing uh, for difficult and how to behave or a weak patient. He make a comment to Dr. Nagy, we should have a difficult airway kit nearby in every intubation, think for difficult 
and how to behave or our exhibition. You are agree with uh, your prof Nagy, and this was a comment. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nagy, for that. Okay. Um, يعني بالحقيقه يعني يعني ده من احسن الفينار اللي اتعملت بصراحه كان فيري انفورماتيف اند كومبريهنسيف كل الانفورميشنز اللي فيه سيام كانت من ذا نايس بير وسام او ذا نايس بير بعد الحسين ووز اكسبشنال اند هايلي انفورماتيف اي بليف ان يوث اند ذير باور and uh, they have uh, a potential power that push us as an elderly people to be in a good place. Uh, they are so experienced enough. They streamed a very difficult information, but streamed it very fruitfully. And uh, uh, they have like a big and mega professor. Thank you, Adil. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. And it was Thank a very fascinating uh, uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yasser, always supporting Thank you very me. much. Always Thank my, you. Always my backbone, sir. This is Thank an honor you. to me to be with you on this webinar, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oswald, Dr. Yasser. Dr. Adel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Muhammad. Thank you, Muhammad Turay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Muhammad Abdul Shafi. Thank you, all of my great attendees. Thank you for your patience and your attendance. Thank you. Thank Happy you August tonight. Happy August tonight. Shalom. <laughs>